Hello and welcome to the Trinity Solution. I'm Rob Campanero. And today's program will be part one of a series where we'll be dealing with the doctrine of justification. And we'll be answering the question, how are sinful men and women made righteous or justified before an infinitely holy God? Now, this won't be as much of a teaching series as it will be a series that deals with the primary objection raised against the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And I think we'll be taking a unique approach as well. So if you're into apologetics and you're someone who's well acquainted with the typical arguments for and against the doctrine, I think this series will be covering ground upon which you may not have tread before. So don't touch that dial. Now, Martin Luther has called the doctrine of justification the article upon which the church stands or falls. And the late R.C. Sproul, expanding on Luther, stated that the doctrine of justification is the article upon which you stand or fall. And, of course, it's the article upon which I stand or fall. Now, if you're someone who professes a belief in Christianity, the question of how we can be sure we'll go to heaven has had to have crossed your mind at least once or twice. And for many, it's just assumed that at the end of our lives, if God determines that our good outweighed our bad, we will be granted entrance into heaven. And of course, the standard for goodness is one which they themselves will contrive, which they're almost certain to meet. And then they live their lives accordingly, fairly certain that their judgment will have a favorable outcome. But if asked why they believe this to be the basis upon which they will enter into heaven, they really can't give you an answer, and certainly not a biblical one. Okay, but then there are those for whom this question can't be answered simply by an appeal to their own personal religious sensitivities, and who just aren't willing to throw the dice in that way. And they need a more substantive basis upon which to base their hopes of making it into the kingdom. Now, for those with strong convictions that what they believe in, in terms of how they're justified before God, must align with Scripture, the question is answered in one of two ways. Justification before God is either by faith alone or justification is by some system of faith plus works. That is, faith is necessary for justification, but not sufficient. So that along with good works, or along with faith, good works must also be performed in order for God to deem the sinner qualified to enter into heaven. Now, for evangelical Protestants, justification is said to be by faith alone. That is, works contribute nothing toward a person's justification. Roman Catholics, on the other hand, as well as the various cults, save one that I'm aware of, would say that justification is by faith plus works. And for Roman Catholics, that is, justification starts with faith in Christ. But as just noted, works are also necessary, and it's those works performed in a state of grace by which they will ultimately be acquitted. Now, it's important to recognize that not all Protestants agree on the meaning of faith alone, just as not all Roman Catholics and the cults would all disagree on what's meant by faith plus works. And I'm certainly not placing the Roman Catholics in the same category as the cults, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the LDS. It's just that, broadly speaking, both groups would hold to some form of justification by faith plus works. All right, so, of course, who's right? <laughs> Are we justified by faith alone, as traditional Protestantism would affirm? Or are we justified by some combination of faith plus works, as Roman Catholics would affirm? Well, by the end of this series, I hope to have resolved this question definitively. And we'll be taking a big step toward resolving that in this study today.
Now, first, just let me say this, that as an evangelical Protestant, I'm persuaded that Scripture teaches with perspicuity that sinners are justified before God by faith alone. And that works, whether performed in a state of grace or otherwise, contribute nothing toward a person's justification. Justification, justification is completely non-meritorious. And the way in which God justifies sinners is through the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now, for those who might be unfamiliar with that term, Imputation simply means to credit or count something or someone with certain qualities or quantities. And so for Protestants, God credits or counts or imputes sinners with the perfect righteousness of his son the moment they believe the gospel. And it's that righteousness alone by which sinners will be acquitted and apart from which they will in fact be condemned. So today, we'll be looking at a text of Scripture which, I'm convinced, presents justification by faith alone with such clarity that it should really cause you to question why a debate even exists. And the text we'll be looking at is found in Romans, the fourth chapter. So, if you have your Bibles, you may open to Romans 4, and we'll be starting with verse 1 and reading up to verse 8. And we'll be reading from the NASB. Okay, so starting with verse 1, we read, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will never take into account. Now, if you are following along in the NASB or most any other translation, you probably noticed that verse 8 or in verse 8, your Bible said the Lord will not take into account sin or something to that effect. Whereas what I read said the Lord will never take sin into account. That's because I provided my own translation at that point. And the reason being that based on my studies, the Greek in Romans 4, 8 is best expressed by the word never rather than just simply not. And I'll fully explain why I believe this is the case in part two. Now, if this is the first time you've ever read Romans 4, 1 through 8, I think most of you, if not all of you, are probably wondering to yourselves, in light of what we just read, from whence cometh the debate? I mean, verse 2 plainly says that Abraham could not boast of his works before God. Verse 3 says that Abraham believed God and it was credited or imputed to him as righteousness. Verse 4 says that righteousness is credited to the one who does not work, but believes. And that it's God who justifies the ungodly and not the ungodly who justify themselves. Verse 6 says that God credits or imputes righteousness apart from works. And verse 7 says that those who are in a state of grace, who Paul calls the blessed man, have had their lawless deeds forgiven and their sins covered, and that for such a man or woman, the Lord will never take sin into account. So how is it that the manner in which a person is justified before God continues to divide Protestants and Catholics? Well, we'll be looking at that more closely in the bit, but for now, I think it'll be helpful to get 
some more background on the exact relationship between Rome's doctrine of justification and the scripture itself. Now, although I consider the cults to be sub-Christian, one thing they have in common with Catholicism is a belief in scripture plus an infallible interpreter. That is, scripture, both would believe that scripture is God's inspired and errant word, but in addition to scripture, God has also gifted his people with an infallible interpreter of those scriptures. And of course, each organization would <laughs> lay unique claim to that position. But one thing that distinguishes Roman Catholicism from the cults is that if you were to ask a Jehovah's Witness or an LDS member why they, they believe their interpretation of a certain soteriological passage is correct, they can direct you to their official documents. Now, the Roman Catholic is at a disadvantage here because the Church of Rome has never rendered an infallible interpretation of any of the soteriological passages. They simply place an anathema on anyone who interprets the scriptures in a way that's contrary to their dogmas. And so we have the Council of Trent in Canons 12, 14, and 24 simply, simply anathematizing justification by faith alone without an appeal to scripture as a basis for that anathema. Now, as is the case with Protestantism, there are millions of nominal Roman Catholics. Okay, that is, they identify with one group or another, but, their re but the reasons for giving credence to their particular brand of religion is superficial at best and vacuous at worst. Okay, they simply go to church every Sunday so they can get their tickets punched and very little thought is ever given to God for the rest of the week. But there's also a relatively smaller number of Roman Catholics and Protestants for whom God and Scripture and the Church teachings are things that occupy their thinking on a much more regular basis and who have much invested in the belief that their understanding of justification is the biblical position. Now, in your poorer countries like Brazil, Spain, Portugal, Mexico, where Catholicism is the dominant religion, there isn't really much of an issue whatsoever. Uh, you know, whatever the church says is simply accepted as true without inquiry. And the fact is, and it's a sad reality, that there are many places in South America where the line of demarcation between Catholicism and the occult is really difficult to determine with any real preci precision. And I only make this point to highlight the fact that in these poorer countries, having a biblical basis for what they believe is simply a non-issue. However, in the United States, which is so heavily influenced by Protestantism, Thoughtful Roman Catholics recognize that if Catholicism is to survive in the U.S., its teachings will need to be brought into some kind of conformity with the text of Scripture. And this is where your Roman Catholic apologists enter into the picture. Now, these men are not sanctioned by the Church or approved by the Pope. Okay, They're simply private theologians who are committed to to the idea that a compatibility between Scripture and Roman dogma does in fact exist. And some names would be those such as Bob Genis, Tim Staples, Jerry Matatix, Scott Hahn, and others. Now, in regards to Scott Hahn, we'll be looking at him in particular in part four, and I think that'll be a interesting, interesting study. Now, as to how works do in fact play a role in the sinner's justification before God, in spite of what we read in Romans 4, 1 through 8, Roman apologists will explain why this is and why Romans 4, 1 through 8 in no way conflicts with Rome's dogmatic teachings in one primary way. 
Now, I have heard it explained differently by one Roman apologist, and he's the only one I've ever heard offer this explanation. So I think he pretty much stands alone among his fellow apologists in that regard. But the primary way in which this text is explained by the Roman apologist is that in Romans 4, 1 through 8, Paul is specifically referring to works of the Mosaic law. So in other words, Paul is not teaching that works of righteousness are non-efficacious in the sinner's justification, but it's the works of the Mosaic law which do not justify. Now, I think I've made this point at least implicitly, but I want to make sure I explicate it so as to preclude any faulty misconceptions of how Rome views works in relation to justification. Now, Rome does not teach, nor has it ever taught, that justification is by works alone. Rome has always taught that it's works performed in a state of grace, which is entered into through faith, which merits justification. But Rome has never taught a crass system of justification by works alone. So according to Rome, sinners are not justified until they're sanctified. Whereas for Protestants, you can't be sanctified until you're first justified. And this is why you'll often hear Roman Catholics refer to the Protestant doctrine of justification as involving God in what they call a legal fiction. That is, God would then declare sinners to be just when they are in fact not just. And so Rome insists that God does not declare a sinner to be just until they are in fact just. So according to Rome, what happens if a person departs this world not having fully met the qualifications for justification? Well, it's at this point that the person must then go to purgatory and undergo the suffering of what's called sadis passio and actually atone for all residual sin. Now, in terms of the books which Catholics and Protestants are in agreement as to their canonicity, there's really only one primary text that Roman Catholic apologists will appeal to, which is found in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Now, we won't be taking the time to look at it, but I'd just like to enter this thought at this point. And that is that by the end of this series, it should be clear that this understanding of that passage simply cannot be harmonized with what the rest of Scripture has to say in regards to how God deals with sin. And so on that basis alone, it must be dismissed. And what should also be clear is that the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone in no way implicates God in a legal fiction. The declaration is legal, to be sure, but it's by no means fictitious. And in part two, we'll be endeavoring to show that the works to which Paul refers in Romans 4 are in no way restricted to those of the Mosaic law. But rather, Paul is referring to all good works, regardless of what category they derive from. Now, if you've listened to much apologetic material on justification, you're no doubt familiar with the arguments on both sides. Okay, if you're a Protestant, you've no doubt listened to R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur, or perhaps a lesser known apologist, uh, but second to none, uh, James White. And if you're a Roman Catholic, you've probably listened to the aforementioned Tim Staples and Bob St. Genis, Jerry Maddox. And whether you're Protestant or Catholic, you've probably seen all the debates. But what we'll be looking at in the upcoming weeks, and I know this is the case for Catholics, simply based on my previous experience, are things that you've probably not been challenged on before. Because these are things which I, as a Protestant, who's been involved in apologetics since really the advent of the Internet, have never heard before. Well, I mean, I've heard them, but just mentioned in passing, but I've never heard them developed 
and utilized as the primary or even the secondary component of an overall case for the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And I think these things are at least as weighty, if not more so, than those you've probably heard ad nauseum. So even if you're no stranger to this debate, I think you'll find the series engaging. Okay, so that will do it for our introduction, and in part two, we'll be looking at Romans 4, 1 through 8 again, to see if Rome's explanation of this passage can actually be substantiated. So please be looking out for that, and if you find these videos helpful, please like and hit the subscribe button so that we can reach more people with this information. So until the next time, Thanks again for watching, and as Robert Cook used to say, walk with the king today and be a blessing.